You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Hi, everybody. It's David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, and I'd like to welcome you to That Gratitude Guy podcast, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. What you can expect is a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget. You can also find out how to become a gratitude believer and generally one to three really key takeaways from my guests on the show. Every uh, Tuesday, my podcast is downloaded at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and it's available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and any other places that you might find your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I sure appreciate that. And then lastly, a lot of people ask me about my gratitude journals and some books and things. And if you're interested in a gratitude journal or anything more around gratitude, coaching, speaking, one-on-one group coaching, et cetera, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. So let me get on with my show. And the favorite part of all, of course, is my guests. And let me just tell you a little brief history about my guest today. I'm excited to have her on the show. Jen Euler is a 20-year sports broadcasting veteran, currently serves uh, currently serving as the Seattle sideline reporter for the Seahawks. He is also an Emmy Award-winning producer and part of the Seattle Mariners television broadcast team on Root Sports. In addition to her work on the sidelines, Jen launched Talk Sporty to Me in, in 2009. She provides a unique twist on business communications based on her time in locker rooms and expertise in one-on-one conversations. Jen is the author of three books and graduated from Southern Methodist University in 2000 with degrees in broadcasting journalism and public policy. Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. And I generally start off because is I've gotten further and further into this podcast, kind of how we met. And so I asked my guest, Jeremy, how did we meet? Well, actually, it was me introducing myself to you based on a rotary talk that you made. And that was, yeah. what, about a month ago? A couple yeah, months ago? it was. Like that. Yep. Yeah. That left a big impression on me. And we'll talk about that in a second. And so let's back up for a second, because I'm sure there's a number of people who knows how many, probably a lot that are aware of you and your work, but kind of take us back to where it started, kind of when the original to get it was it in to get into broadcasting was into the sports in particular, how did it kind of happen maybe after Southern Methodist University and so forth? You know, actually, I would have to say it was before I entered college and I have a high school guidance counselor to thank. I thought I was going to be a Lutheran school teacher and teach third graders. And, you know, she brought this idea to me that I thought was very outlandish. And she said, you know, Jennifer, look, you like to talk a lot and you are not afraid to talk in front of people. Have you ever considered broadcasting? And I I thought it was crazy because who knew even how to get into broadcasting to begin with, right? I I thought I was picking a pretty good road and being a teacher, but she sparked my interest in it. I figured out what classes I needed to take, what college would be a good one for somebody who was pursuing that career. And sports was a natural fit for me. I grew up watching sports, playing sports. My younger brother played sports. And so I figured if I was going to spend a lot of time talking about something, sports was probably going to be it. And I know that for a lot of folks, broadcasting in general just seems like such an odd career, right? And and Mm -hmm. a curious career path. But truly, it's just like anything else. And that you start by taking your classes, you get your degree, you get an internship, and then you just kind of progress just like you would in any other job. And 20 years later, here I am working on the television broadcast for the Mariners and radio broadcast for the Seahawks. That's so cool. And do you remember her name? Yes, Sandra. Sandra. The reason I mentioned it is because think about the difference that Sandra made for you, the the absolute taking a left versus taking a right. I was doing a a workshop at a camp at Seabeck Conference Center last week, and so I I taught for five days. And the last day we did this thing, and I'm not suggesting you have to do this, but you can consider. 
is where we have somebody write a letter to somebody to tell them how grateful they are for the role that they played in their life. So Sandra would be a great candidate for that. Yes. In fact, I, I have done that. And I think she oh, was cool. surprised. I reached out to her a few years ago on LinkedIn. I am quite certain she did not expect to hear from me on LinkedIn, but it was really cool um, to be able to share with her that that made a big impression on me. Yeah. And it's just amazing because as we grow up, and as you mentioned, you go to classes, you get the degree, you get an internship, and you go through the different stages. And it's interesting how we all should be mentored by somebody and also mentor people ourselves. But somehow it's it's like when you grow up, now you're the person that's impacting other people. And so maybe she didn't remember. So look how much I in, impacted Jen Mueller. We forget that sometimes. It's like when I was growing up, my dad was always Mr. Brook. I, I don't call me Mr. Brook. That's my dad. You know, it's like you always forget that next stage. So when you reached out to her, was she pretty touched or impressed or how did she yes, react? She was. She was really touched. Um, and again, I, I don't think that she realized... I, who knows how many suggestions she made to other high school students that mm -hmm. were never acted on, right? Um, and I came from a small Lutheran high school. It's not like it was a big school where, you know, it just seemed obvious that you were going to go and do big things, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, she was, she was really touched to be able to hear that. And I will say I have made it a point, not just for her, but for lots of people to make sure that they know that I am grateful for the role they play in my life. Mm -hmm. I wish that I would have sent her an actual handwritten thank you note, and I can still do that. She's still lives in Texas. She still lives close to my old high school, but that is one of the, um, I'm going to say not, not secrets to my success, but I think a really underrated part of being a successful professional mm -hmm. is handwritten thank you notes. Yeah, boy, that is so big. And I even, I'm always listening to podcasts and different things to get ideas to the different modules that I teach all around gratitude. And I did a lot of them this last week at that camp because I was there for five days. But I got this from somebody recently where I really liked the idea. It was write the letter down and it doesn't have to be, you know, more than two or 300 words. I mean, it doesn't have to be some huge thing. But then now that we're post COVID is try to get together one for a cup of coffee, go to Starbucks, go to get your coffee and then say, Jen, I have something I'd like to read to you. So it's already written but then in person to the person. And I was thinking, man, if we you did that, it'd probably be hard to keep both people being tearing up from something like that. <laughs> I because, was going to say, yeah. But you'd already thought the letter through just sitting down. So you had to organize your thoughts. But now I want you to listen to this and I read it. And I thought that was really cool. So I had the people on the last day promise that they were going to do that for somebody like a Sandra in their life that was really important. So yeah, that's really cool. And I always think, can you, can you send somebody flowers too many times? Can you send yeah. them too many gratitude notes, you know, and so forth. So, but speaking of, you said gratitude is the role. How much would you say has gratitude played a part in your sort of mindset? It's, it's obviously all I talk about, or at least the main thrust is focusing on what you have versus what you don't have, but how has it played a role in Jen's life? I think that it is the reason I am where I am in my career. Mm. This is a really tough career and it is really competitive. And I want to say that that is true for every profession that you choose, right? We think of broadcasting as being particularly cutthroat and it can be, and it can be very subjective. And it takes a long time to see real payoff. And there's a lot of grind and there's a lot of working in the dark. And there's a lot of wondering if what you're doing today will end up paying off at any point in time. Mm -hmm. If you can have gratitude for the experience that you have today, it makes it a whole lot easier to look forward to tomorrow. Even if you were working 16 hour shifts on a holiday and you don't see your family on Christmas for 15 years. And you know, wow. even if you're working until three o'clock in the morning and wondering if it matters at 3 p.m. when you show up to work the next day, right? If I can just be grateful that I had the opportunity to be there and to show up, it makes it easier to keep showing up. And I promise that if I would not have had that mindset, I would have quit a long time ago because wow. working three jobs early in my career to pay the bills and working crazy hours wouldn't have been worth it if I couldn't have found joy and gratitude in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm. And and I was thinking too, for the listeners, viewers that may or may not know, you mentioned the word cutthroat. So for those that may not know or have never been in that or have just noticed it from afar, what makes that particular industry so cutthroat? It's very subjective. 
And I think that's the hard part, right? When you are dealing in soft skills like communication and broadcasting, there's a lot of external factors that go into whether you think I'm good at my job, right? I can have the degree, I can have the experience, but if you don't like the sound of my voice, if you don't like the way I look, if you don't like the way I do an interview or characterize a situation, I'm not going to be employed in my position very long. And it's not because I necessarily did anything wrong. It's because it didn't fall in what you wanted my position to look like. So that's one reason that it's cutthroat. Interesting. The other is you are early on in your career, it feels like there's not that many opportunities. And so in some cases, it feels like you are racing to get to that next thing before somebody else does. Mm. Now, what you will realize, as happens to every leader and every professional who has the benefit of perspective and time um, and experience, the job you are always meant to have will be yours, right? Like you can work towards that job. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, it's really hard to see that. And it just feels like you are out for yourself and nobody else is going to help you. And it, it's, um, it's not always the warmest or most welcoming environment to work in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really an interesting point because you mentioned a 20-year career. And sometimes looking down the road is the most difficult thing to do because all you see is what's in front of you this day, this week, maybe this month. What kind of kept you... The, the so-called I am the prize, if you will, during that time to get where you are now? Well, I think that it's being competitive and it's competitive against myself. You know, mm -hmm. there were so many people that told me I wasn't going to do it, that I couldn't do it. And when I entered the industry, there were not a whole lot of women doing this job. That's so right. I understand where the skepticism came from, but mm -hmm. I was always in competition to prove that I could do it. And I think this is an important distinction that helps with gratitude. If you are trying to prove something to somebody else, you will lose every single time. Mm. If you are trying to prove something to yourself, now is where I can, again, appreciate the opportunities and be grateful. I was a high school football official for 10 years. I started in college. I was an intramural flag football official. And when I joined the high school chapter of officials, I was the only female. I officiated in Dallas, which is a huge suburb in the state of Texas where football is king, right? And I would always have people ask me, you know, do you think there should be more women officiating football? And my response is the same now as it was then, only if it's something that you are passionate about. Right. If you are doing it to prove to everybody else that you can do it, it is a miserable existence. You've got to choose that that is what you want to do and you want to be passionate about and you want to be energetic about. Such an important point. And I think the word passion, although it gets used a little bit overly, overly used, I should say, I, I don't think you can overstate its value. I, a lot of my contemporaries are either retired, semi-retired or doing other things. And I just think it's a problem. And sure enough, I caught a nugget the other day that they did a study that people that are passionate about something, now this was more senior people and people have been around a little longer, lived on an average seven to eight years longer. And I totally believe it. And they went and did the studies when you've got something, I'm very passionate about what I do and speaking and coaching and talking and everything. So what a key point that is. And, and, and you mentioned that too. I was actually to bring this up too, about you were on, not on was the cutting edge, but really the early edge of women doing this. So that put even more of a, I won't say a burden on you, but maybe more of a, uh, the consistency or the persistence, I guess, that you really had to have to succeed. I would say that the challenge was not having very many people whose paths I could follow. Mm. Right? Like you're just mm -hmm. trying to figure it out and you're hoping that you're taking the next right step. And me as the type A planner who wanted to know that this was gonna be a straight line and that I could get from point A to point B, it was really hard to have the zigzags early on in my career. I did not get to this point in a very traditional way. And so trying to figure out if it was the right way really stressed me out again. Time and experience has taught me there is no right way. And I hope that what I have been able to do in my career just gives somebody else an idea for what kind of path they could mm -hmm. follow. Because it's easier. Whether you choose to take that same path or not is irrelevant. It's just having some options and knowing that it can look different for different people. Right. And then there's that idea of motivation, which I've kind of decided, at least in my little world, 
that I'm now comfortable with the answer to the question being, I don't know, because I just cannot figure out why some people are so motivated. So here we're talking about gratitude for the experience, being competitive with myself, proving something to myself and not worrying about other people. And you're just pushing yourself forward. Well, I'll guarantee you there's a pretty good chance there's nobody behind Jen. It's the gal in the mirror every morning that you're dealing with that keeps you going. And then there's other people that have very little motivation. And I just, I, I, I just will, I don't think I'm ever going to figure out why that is, but somehow it was in you and it just kept pushing you. Well, I think there's two things there. One, the true passion that I have, I love my job. I love being able to talk sports. I love being able to deliver um, information and content to an audience, but the true passion is people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. every time I feel like I'm unsure if I'm in the right spot, it's always a conversation or a smile or a former athlete that makes a comment that I realize it really is connecting with people that has always driven me and will continue to drive me. So that's part of it. When you are motivated by those relationships, it's easier to keep going. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing is I am really blessed and lucky that I work in locker rooms and clubhouses. Mm -hmm. It is hard not to be motivated when you are surrounded by people who are literally the best in the world at mm. what they do and you see them doing that on a daily basis. Right. If I am in my workout, which I do every morning, and I think about stopping a few reps short, or I ran this morning and I think, you know what, I could just walk the last half mile. You know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about the guys that I just saw on the field yesterday practicing for the Seahawks and go, yeah, what would they say if they knew that I just decided eh, it was enough? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Eh, I didn't need to do that work, right? Like when you are surrounded by world-class people, you develop world-class habits. And I, I'm fortunate that I am always around that environment. Yeah. That, and that's very true. And you hear the old cliches you're known by the company you keep or one bad apple spoils the bunch. I thought about something I, had, I hadn't experienced in 20 or 30 years was playing pool. And remember, I was went to the University of Washington. You'd play pool and everybody put their quarters up. And so then you'd be playing pool and you'd shoot. So if it was somebody that was no good, it's like, you're just sloppy. You're like just doing whatever. And, but if it was somebody that's really good, you knew if you missed a shot, that's it. They're going to run the table and you're not playing for another hour and a half. So guess what? Did you bear down on that? So surrounded by people that are motivated, gosh, what a good example of known by the company you keep. And you think of all these world-class athletes, whether it's baseball, football, whatever it might be, but it just still is to show if you play with the better tennis players, another one I've heard that you're going to stay motivated. But I think there's also still a core in this case of Jen Mueller, that's still there that sometimes doesn't seem to be, I've seen people that, that are hanging around a lot of very motivated, motivated, talented people, and it doesn't rub off on them much too. So I think it has to be there at a core. In fact, one of the things I was thinking after this 20 years, when we have this picture of where we're going to go, we, whether it's a daydream or a crystal ball, what, what if anything has been different as you look back to Jen of 20 years ago, thinking where you're going to be now, what is maybe different now that I thought, hmm, I, I guess maybe I expected to have it impact me more this way, or is there something that sort of is at the top of the list that was really different and how you projected yourself out 20 years ago to now? Yeah, I never would have imagined that this is how it's all turned out. Wow. 20 years ago, if you were to ask me what my dream job was, I would have said if I could be a local sports broadcaster. I didn't care what market it was in. I didn't care if I worked weekends or weekdays. I just wanted to be a local sports broadcaster, because I thought being known in the community and being able to cover community sports, whether that was professional sports, college sports, that would just be the greatest thing. Now, remember, if you have heard the entire time that you have been in college, you're going to be lucky to ever get a job and you're probably not going to stay in the industry, your bar is set pretty low for what yeah. success is, right? Right. I never could have imagined the dream job that I currently have. Oh, that's and fantastic. my dream job doesn't exist for anybody else. This is a job that I got into and I have chosen the parts that I love most. Nobody else in the country has the same job responsibilities that I do. And they shouldn't strive for that because it's not their dream job. But what I would say looking back on that is you think you know what you want and you think that the best thing that you can imagine is this. And the best thing that you could possibly imagine might be a complete 180 that would blow your mind and that you would never know. So what I've learned from that is to stay open to the possibilities, right? And to recognize that 
the next phase of my career could entail something I never imagined. And that doesn't mean that I should just be happy with what I'm doing. I am content, but I would be open to other things because who knows how great that could turn out too. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, again, some of the things and noting that be, com be competitive with myself, prove something to myself, not others. And then, of course, passion. We talked about that and you love your job. They say the surveys will tell you 70 to 80 percent of the people in the country hate their jobs. And Monday's the worst day of the week and Wednesday and all that kind of thing. So if you go back, if somebody's listening and think, well, gosh, I want to aspire to what Jen has done. And if you were to boil it down to maybe I think I know what you're going to say, but for them listening, maybe the two or three things that are critical elements, what would you say to that person? Jen, I want to be just, I want to follow the path, even though you got way beyond what you expected. What would you tell them or two or three of the elements that, that would be important? I would say the number one thing you can do, and this is in any job, whether you want to be me, whether you want to work in media or whether you want to become a CEO, mm -hmm. find a way to show up consistently. Mm. And consistently means that you are showing up on a consistent basis. And when you show up, you are consistent in how you show up. One of the things I tell interns and people trying to network into any sort of opportunity is you have got to be seen to the point where people do not remember the space without you, right? So to get my job with the Seahawks, I spent six years positioning myself for that job. The job was full. It, it wasn't like I had an opportunity to audition for it. I knew the gal that was the sideline reporter. I did not want to see her leave. I just wanted to make it known that if she ever did leave that position, I would like for them to consider me. Now, this was a bit of a stretch at the time because I was not on air. I was behind the scenes as a producer. I was producing TV sports broadcasts. But I had media credentials that allowed me to be at every single Seahawks practice. Nice. I took my vacation days and I paid my way to go to Cheney, Washington, which is where the Seahawks held training camp. And right. I worked my butt off for a week. I did that every year for three years. I showed up at every game, at every press conference, at every practice. And then I went to go work my normal job. That's an important part of the story, right? I, wow. I wasn't shirking responsibilities to do something else. By the time that job opened up, I'm pretty sure most people in the organization thought I already worked there because they saw me so much. Right, right. But the audition was a piece of cake. Mm. I knew everybody. I knew the players. I knew the storylines. And equally as important, they knew me. They knew that I was willing to show up. They knew that I had a smile on my face. They knew that I was willing to work hard. And that was half the battle. Now, in year three of doing that, you go back to, man, why am I sitting out here in 100 degree weather for two day <laughs> practices to shoot one stand up that nobody's ever going to remember? But if you are committed to showing up consistently, people understand what it's like to work with you and who you really are. So find that opportunity and run with it. Excellent. And I think that segues nicely into somewhere in the back of your mind all the way along was an intention to get where you wanted to get, whether it's going to be 10 years, 20 years, whatever. And that segues nicely into, I want to make sure we get this in, in the next five or 10 minutes is talk sporty to me, because when I, that left such an impression on me. So tell the listeners about the intentional aspect of that and how you got into talk sporty with me in 2009. Yeah, it was kind of an accident. Again, I did not see myself as an entrepreneur. I saw myself as a great talker who wanted to speak to more audiences, right? So I created a job so that I could keep talking to people, just like all of my teachers said, you know, talks too much on every single report card. <laughs> but Talk Sporty to me really focuses on a couple of things. One, leveraging the power of sports fandom in business, because talking about scores and outcomes and stats is a very small part of what you could be using sports to do. Mm. And number two, understanding how to be more intentional about the conversations that you already have, because it is something I am forced to do on a regular basis. I get 15 seconds sometimes to tell a story. I get five seconds to make an impression with a player. It's not like when I go into a locker room or a clubhouse, it's not like these guys are going to sit down and have coffee with me, right? Like when I network with players, it happens five seconds at a time. It happens when I say hello. It happens when I wave. Um, it happens in these really quick interactions and I have to be intentional. Otherwise that's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it shows up when I go to then ask for the real interview and it falls flat and I can't deliver for my audience. Right? Mm -hmm. So 
when you're on TV or radio, we have very tight timelines to follow. We think that in normal conversations, we have all the time in the world to make our point with our teammates or colleagues or bosses or friends, but we could all benefit from being more intentional with how we communicate the message that we share and the way that we direct conversation. So really, if you were to read any of the blog posts or take a look at the videos, you would see those two themes coming out. And then it all ties back to leadership because leadership comes down to people and communication. Correct. And something left a big impression on me, tell the listeners about ETA, not estimated time of arrival. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So the next time you use ETA, here's what I want you to think about. Expectation, timeline, and action item. Mm -hmm. And so you already know the story, but when you ask a player for an interview, there's a big difference between saying, hey, David, do you have time to talk today? Versus, hey, David, do you have time for two questions? I'd like to preview the Yankees series. I can find you after batting practice. Excellent. Yeah. Now we actually know what we're agreeing to. And when we lay out expectation, timeline, and action item, we have helped people understand where they fit into the conversation, what needs to happen, who's responsible for next steps. It is a really clear way to communicate, keep everybody on the same page, and have accountability in those conversations. And another thing, and well said, thank you. And as you know, that made a big impression on me. And I've started to use that in my everyday conversation. And what I think is neat about it is you talk about 15 second segments or five second segments. This is all you have. And this is the players or what have you. But in many ways, why it's so applicable, in my opinion, is because people have such short attention spans. Now, they're not going to listen to you much longer than five or 15 seconds anyway. So you might as well get your point across. But another one that I had that was just what was the other aspect of it on the ETA, and the, I know what it was, is the answer with a success statement. I love that. Tell the listeners about that. Yeah, it is really being intentional with a question that I know that you were going to get at least a dozen times today. And that question is, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> and I think we, we fall back on a script and typically the answer would be fine or good, or if you're overly optimistic, it's going to be awesome or great or something like that. But that really is your moment to direct the conversation where you want it to go. And it's your moment to stay on the radar of people. And so a success statement is something that you are proud of, whether it's a personal accomplishment, a milestone, or something you're excited to talk about. And it's one sentence that relates to your audience. So if I'm talking to my boss at work, a success statement would be, hey, John, I'm great. And I'm ahead of schedule on the show that you've asked me to produce for next month. He knows that I'm doing my job. He sees me on TV every night. Mm -hmm. But for him to know that I'm ahead of schedule on a project he's assigned just keeps me on the radar in a different way and puts his mind at ease, right? So So you can do that with different people that you're talking to because that's your your moment. I mean, that that is the conversation starter. And where it really got me, and I have applied it already, is instead of saying, what time do you want to get together on Zoom? Let's do four o'clock. Let's go back Friday. Friday doesn't work. Thursday is this. How about, and I believe this is the example, something to use. How about we meet on Friday at four o'clock to review the Smith file? I want to cover A, B, and C. We don't have to worry about D. And let me know if that doesn't work, then Monday at 11 o'clock would work. Right, great. Thanks. Send. And it's so clean and not all this back and forth and this waste of time. And people, like I said, people's attention spans are so funny. I was talking to somebody the other day and the whole time they're like, like looking over my head, looking at somebody else. And I finally, do you want to talk to them? You go ahead and talk to them. It's, it's okay. <laughs> but people are, it's like just so funny. So I want to get, I want to make sure I ask you about your books too. And we're going to wrap up in about five or 10 minutes. But one of the things I'm kind of curious about is that I've always heard this question before and I kind of like it. When you're talking to the players, I think the average fan would be thinking about whether it's the Mariners or Seahawks or whatever. And gosh, wouldn't that be cool to be a player? And then that, that would be Jen. She gets to interview them. What's something that the average fan would like to know that might surprise them that Jen Mueller has found out from talking to these various athletes that they may not know, or it might surprise them. I think they would be surprised to know that they are human beings Mm. and that every single reaction you have, they have. And 
Simone Biles helped bring this to the forefront during the Olympics. And wow, I wrote a yes. post about this and I wish that I could take everybody into a locker room with me. I can't, don't ask, um, <laughs> because I don't think people understand what it's like. They think it's glamorous or they think it's sexy and they get really disappointed when I describe it as a workplace environment because that's what it is. Right. And it's really hard to relate to athletes if you put them on a pedestal as being superhumans or having the superhero um, type of skills that they have. But if you just take a step back and realize, you know what success feels like, you know what it feels like to be frustrated by a teammate who didn't pull his or her weight. You know what it feels like to screw up and let people down. You know what it feels like to have a good day at work or a bad day at the office. They are feeling and experiencing the exact same things. If I relate to them as human beings, the human beings and the people that they are, that conversation is so much more open, right? It is not about how much they accomplished in the game, right? It is not about their career stats. Uh, Ken Griffey Jr., Hall of Famer, the last thing he wants to hear about when we have conversations is my favorite home run and what he did during his career. He's got that. What he wants is for somebody to understand what it feels like right now for him to be proud of his kids when whatever their kids are doing, right? Well, and, and, I, and, and I think that fans overlook that part. And I think back to the intentional conversations and the ETA and so forth, that helps with that so much because it's so much more, just this goo goo gaga people that just, like you said, they've answered those questions a thousand times. And, and I've listened to enough podcasts now of a lot of famous people, and you can tell that they just get sick and tired that they understand their position, where they've gotten, and they've got to be a famous movie star or sports figure or whatever, but gosh, have a little creativity. And, and do something a little bit different. So I think that's cool. So I want to make sure I touch on, you've done three books. Tell the audience about the books you've done and just a little snippet on each book. Yeah, the very first book was kind of the how-to guide on how to become a sports fan for business. I will need to update that one because a few of the examples have changed. But the basic gist is if you Google how to become a sports fan, they're going to give you the worst advice in the world. Sports fans do not start with a rule book and then work up to talking about a game. So I laid it out ways that you could do that in five minutes a day. The second book was Talk Sporty to Me, Thinking Outside the Box Scores. And that goes into how to look at sports more than just outcomes, players, and fans. But how do you use it to get on the radar of people, build relationships, and to enhance your personal brand? And the one that I wrote most recently, which was still a few years ago, was The Influential Conversationalist, and that is conversation skills that develop leadership potential. So some of those intentional strategies, and then I had um, some of the Seahawks are in the book as um, people that I quoted who have been on, the, on both sides of that conversation that I've had with them. Mm. So it really comes down to, look, they're easy reads, they're meant to be easy and giving you ways to implement new communication strategies instantly, but just get you to think more strategically about your objective in conversations and in interviews and in all of your interactions. Excellent. Excellent. And I'll put those, those books in the show notes too. I'll put the links for those as well. So I want to just kind of wrap up with, I've got one final question for you. And I was thinking that I've always liked to kind of target some takeaways and I put Gratitude for the experience, I think, is so important when you talked about going forward and having the carrot that kept you going forward. Competitive within myself, improve something to myself, not others, I think is so important. One of the five regrets of the dying is that people say they wish they'd been truer to themselves and not and the lives for themselves and not the lives others wanted for them, that they thought, I think about the parents that forced the child to become a doctor or whatever, and they didn't really want to be. Uh, be passionate and love my job. Again, I think that's so important. Have a true passion for people. Uh, this that's surrounded by people that are motivated. I never thought about that. When you think about the locker rooms and the clubhouses and things like, look at all these people at the top of their game, um, the top of their profession and how that cannot, I mean, they're motivated just by definition of the role that they play. And so that rubs off on you. I love uh, find a way to show up consistently. Gosh, that's so important. It just whatever it is, consistency is such a key. And then the final thing that I have is this expectations of uh, ETA expectations, timeline and action items for the conversation. I think that's so cool. So uh, Jen, I always ask my uh, guests, this is my final question for today is, and you get to, you can do one or two things, but I always like one thing is where at whatever age you're at today, what do you know today 
that you would have liked to have known at 18 that really would have helped you that if you would have told your 18 year old self back then from today in this whole life of experience? There's no right way to do things. If you apply the right passion, intent, and work ethic, you can figure this out, right? It, it's um, how much are you willing to bet on yourself? And if you are willing to bet that all of those things that you have, the work ethic, the passion, the skill, the motivation are enough, you're gonna figure out a way to get there. And it would have saved me a lot of stress and self-doubt if I just would have realized that early on. And I lied. I said, last question. You just made me think of a second one. And I like this question because I think I mentioned it earlier about sometimes the answer is, I don't know. Where did Jen Mueller's motivation come from? That is a good question. I can't remember a time where I didn't have it. So it was there. It was just, there. It's in you. See, I think that's, I said, I like the answer. I don't know sometimes. I used to think there has to be an answer for every question in the world. There just has to be. You can't say, I don't know. And, but I be, I'm beginning to believe that I don't know is a good answer. And I think you can look at parents, uh, professors, mentors, coaches, uh, role players, people like that. But sometimes you just have it. And I think when I think about my favorite word, gratitude, how grateful is Jen just to have that? So that's excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Let me wrap up the episode as I always do with a couple of comments for everybody. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, as I've mentioned, and it's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear, and I do appreciate that. To purchase a gratitude journal or find out more about my gratitude coaching, speaking, you can connect with me at That Gratitude Guy. And also, a lot of people like to receive my Monday Morning Minute. It's a 60-second video I send out every Monday morning about uh, gratitude, surprisingly enough. And you text Gratitude Guy to 22828. That's 22828, and you just type in Gratitude Guy. And it also is exclusive to my podcast listeners. I'm offering my three-month proprietary uh, gratitude coaching program with two extra months free for the listeners. Just email me if you are interested in that. So finally, thank you all for tuning in. And until next time, I say it every single time, remember, be grateful and never quit. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.